This podcast is brought to you by the School of Advanced Study, University of London. Well, good, uh, good evening, and uh, welcome to this uh, fourth Douglas Johnson uh, Memorial uh, Lecture in, uh, in French uh, history. It's uh, good to uh, see you, so many of you here, and uh, thank you very much uh, for, uh, for coming along. And uh, I'm sure we, uh, we have uh, a great uh, evening uh, ahead of us, because uh, just in case I, uh, I forget, back in uh, the, uh, the room uh, behind us, uh, there is some uh, some wine and uh, refreshments uh, after the uh, the lecture uh, is uh, is over. But uh, of course, uh, a particular uh, welcome to uh, some members uh, of the uh, the Johnson uh, family, including uh, Madeleine, uh, uh, Douglas's uh, widow, but uh, but also uh, her uh, daughter, son-in-law, and uh, and granddaughter. So uh, this evening we uh, were graced with the, the presence of uh, three generations of, uh, of, of Johnson, so a particular uh, welcome uh, to, uh, to you. Uh, and uh, we are of course uh, recalling uh, Douglas Johnson's uh, great contribution to, uh, to, to French history and indeed uh, French uh, studies uh, in general, uh, particularly during the, uh, the time, uh, the um, roughly 30 years, that uh, he spent as uh, professor of uh, French history at uh, University uh, College uh, London. And uh, one of the, uh, the great things uh, about uh, Douglas was that uh, he moved very, uh, very freely across the, uh, the channel between uh, this country uh, and, uh, and France. And uh, that very much informs the, uh, the lectures uh, that we've uh, created uh, in his, uh, his uh, honour that uh, there should be a, a cross-channel uh, connection and of course uh, as you'll realize that's uh, going to be very much uh, uh, in evidence uh, this evening because uh, one of the things that was said uh, about Douglas uh, was that uh, he sought to uh, explain the French to the English and vice versa the, uh, the English to the, uh, to the French and of course uh, that is a, a theme that's uh, quite topical literally at this, uh, at this moment. Uh, I'm sure I don't need to, uh, to go into uh, the uh, uh, goings on at the, uh, the presidency or with uh, Francois Hollande. Uh, yesterday it was quite amusing wasn't it? He was trying to draw a very clear distinction between uh, croissant on the one hand, and uh, croissance on, uh, <laughs> on, the, uh, on, the, uh, on the other, and uh, seeking very much to uh, turn the attention to, uh, to economics rather than his uh, private life. But uh, the uh, press conference he, uh, he gave yesterday uh, led the, uh, the Guardian uh, this morning to, uh, to say that uh, they, uh, they, they do these things differently in France. And of course, uh, for those of us who are uh, interested in uh, studying uh, France, or indeed uh, just uh, appreciating and, uh, and visiting France, that is, uh, is one of the, uh, the great uh, joys of uh, the, uh, the, uh, the, the subject. But uh, this evening, uh, turning to this evening, I'm very pleased to, uh, to welcome uh, Professor uh, Andrew Knapp, who uh, comes to us from uh, the, uh, the University of, uh, of Reading, where uh, he's uh, involved uh, both in, uh, in French studies and also uh, European uh, studies and uh, he uh, is uh, a specialist in, uh, in French uh, politics uh, more, more generally but uh, in uh, recent years he has uh, specialised in the subject that he's, uh, he's going to, uh, to talk about uh, this evening, uh, namely uh, the, uh, the impact and uh, effects of, uh, of bombing uh, in, uh, in France. Uh, in the, uh, the early uh, 19, uh, 1940s, between 1940 and uh, 1945. But uh, of course he's uh, bringing uh, a, a, an English dimension uh, to it uh, and uh, talking about the, uh, the subject of uh, bombing and memory, Britain and France, 1942 uh, to 1945. He's uh, written on the subject. We've been uh, pleased to uh, publish uh, an article of his uh, in, uh, in French history, but I think it was last year uh, a book came out <coughs> with uh, Claudia Baldini on the, uh, the, uh, the subject of... Forgotten uh, Blitzes. Sorry, sorry. Forgotten Blitzes. Forgotten Blitzes, that's, uh, that's right. Thank you uh, for uh, reminding me. So uh, we uh, very much look, uh, look forward 
to, uh, to hearing him uh, speak on this uh, particular subject uh, this evening. Uh, Andrew, thank you very much indeed. Thank you very much. Um, thank you. Et merci d'être venu aussi nombreux. And particularly a thank you to the family for coming this evening. It's a great honour and a pleasure to be invited here to give the Douglas Johnson Memorial Lecture. I knew Douglas, no doubt, less well than many of you in this room, but he was our external examiner when I started working at Reading. And at the inevitable dinner with externals, I talked to him about what I was working on, which was, at the time, Gaulism since de Gaulle. And that he should listen to me and listen carefully was, I thought at the time, no more than my due. <coughs> <laughs> I was a young man once. <laughs> with hindsight, I realised that a friendly and disinterested attention to the work of younger colleagues is very far from guaranteed among mature academics. It is rather the mark both of a generous spirit and of one committed to the future of his profession. And Douglas was both of those things. Memory, as Nancy Wood wrote 15 years ago, is decidedly in fashion. Hardly less so now, I think, than when she wrote it then. I recall a colleague from this university a few years ago, trying to dismiss it as a bit of a fad. Perhaps, he said in a rather hopeful tone, in a few years the study of memory will have become no more than a memory. <laughs> and at the time I rather sympathised. Surely, I thought, historians should be finding out what happened rather than how other people try and remember what happened. Well, up to a point. But sooner or later, even the historian who tries to confine himself or herself to what happened is likely to face issues of memory in at least two ways. First, in challenging received interpretations of history, the historian is in the business of changing, of shaping memory. Robert Paxton did that fairly devastatingly with his book on Vichy France in 1972. Second, the historian cannot escape the importance of memory in the making of history. For example, the way we waged World War II was profoundly shaped by memories of how we had waged World War I. Strategic bombing was seen as an acceptable, even as a more humane alternative to what Sir Arthur Harris, who admittedly had a stake in the matter, called finding sufficient morons willing to be sacrificed in a mud war in Flanders. For Germany, the possibility of World War II was shaped by a distorted memory of World War I, of betrayal by the stab in the back. This form of memory, in which history, often in a mangled version, is manipulated to induce a sense of mass victimhood, is surely the clearest enemy of the historian. Memory can poison. A flawed, partial, resentful vision of the past is the surest sh guarantee of a flawed and potentially disastrous future. So there is every reason why historians should be engaging themselves with memory. In France, in the spring-summer of 2014, we will see the collision of two commemorations the World War I centenary, which is not our concern here, and the 70th anniversary of D-Day, and of the events leading from there to the liberation of French territory in August and September 1944. The 70th anniversary of D-Day, of course, is important not for any special numerical reason, surely three quarters of a century would have been more appropriate on that criterion, but because the cohort of participants is now shrinking rapidly and will dwindle more speedily in the next five to ten years. We can expect on past form to hear a great deal in the D-Day commemorations about the bravery of the men who gave their lives that day for Europe's liberation, about the dedication of the men and women who made the Normandy landings possible, 
about the need to safeguard the benefits of the peace and reconciliation achieved since then. Quite rightly so. I wonder, though, how much we will hear about the 2,200 or so French civilian deaths occurred, incurred in the first 24 hours after the landings. The great majority of these happened as a result of Allied bombing raids on French towns. These raids were planned at the very beginning of 1944, at a meeting on 21st January with Montgomery and Eisenhower present, <coughs> Air Chief Marshal Sir Trafford Lee Mallory, who had been assigned the command of the Tactical Air Forces, had announced the policy of, I quote, flattening out important centres of road communication. And so, 3,488 tonnes of bombs were dropped <coughs> on so-called communications targets, small Norman towns, in those first 24 hours. That's the total for Bomber Command alone, quite aside from the Americans. There's no evidence that these attacks achieved, to any significant extent, their objective of slowing the movement of German troops. The Wehrmacht was resourceful enough to find ways round temporarily blocked towns, and these ways were often better sheltered from Allied air attack than the roads that were destroyed. Their chief result, then, was... 740 civilian dead in Lisieux, 352 in Saint-Lô, 300 in Vire, 254 in Coutances, 200 for the moment in Caen, 100 in condé sur noiro 17 in Pont-l'Évêque, and so on. This part of the D-Day story isn't unknown. I don't claim to have unearthed any startling new evidence here, but it is, to a considerable degree, marginalised from the grand narrative. I want to step back a moment and sort of put this on a larger canvas because what interests me this evening is the contrast between how we in the United Kingdom remember the bombing of our country by the Germans and how the French remember the bombing of their country by, mostly by, the Allies. If we limit ourselves to the figures, to the death toll, the two look broadly comparable. Just short of 44,000 civilians in Britain died as a result of enemy bombing from September 1939 to the end of 1941. Most of them in the period between September 40 and May 41 that we call the Blitz. A further 5,600 or so died in raids in 1942 and 43, and then just over 10,000 from the start of 1944 to the end of the war not least due to the V-weapons offensive. There are also the Northern Irish, who for some reason are not included year by year, and we arrive at a total of 60,595 uh, deaths in the UK, or roughly 16% of all UK civilian and military deaths in the conflict. What about France? Here, the death toll is rather more disputed. Some respectable historians, like Patrick Facon, put the total as high as 75,000. I've chosen minimum figures here. I'd be surprised if it was much higher than 60,000 or much lower than 50, 55,000. Of course, total French deaths in World War II have also been disputed to a greater extent than the UK figures. Peter Lagrou's estimate of 400,000 overall is perhaps minimum. Of that, if we take that figure 400,000, then deaths from bombing within France represent about 14% of the total. It's rather fewer than the 75,000 Jews deported from France and killed. It's a comparable number to that of the non-Jewish deaths outside France, that is, prisoners of war who died, political prisoners, and forced laborers, about 60,000 in all, some of whom were actually themselves have been victims of Allied bombs. As to the chronology, the numbers are more or less inverted compared to the UK. They are relatively low in 1940, although a significant number do die from German bombing. They are lower in 1941 and then pick up again in 42-43. But, of course, quite logically, the largest death toll um, occurs in France when France becomes 
the battlefield once more. About 40,000 people die in 1940. But for our purposes, the really important thing is that we're looking at broadly comparable figures. A somewhat lower total for France, probably, but at the same order of grandeur. And the same holds true for individual raids. The deadliest night of the Blitz on 10th to 11th May 1941 claimed 1,436 lives. The heaviest single raid, as far as the death toll was concerned, in France, the raid on Marseille by the 15th US Air Force on 27th May 1944, killed 1,831 people. Again, comparable levels of human fatalities. I'd add, too, that in both countries the bombing was very widespread. In Britain, London and Coventry have perhaps obscured the bombing of Plymouth or Bristol or Liverpool or Hull or Glasgow or even Belfast. In France, the bombing of, for example, Caen tends to overshadow that of Marseille, Biarritz, Avignon, Annecy, Sisteron, not places we usually associate with bombing, or Chartres, or Nantes, or even Montmartre. The Bomber Command War Diaries, an indispensable source for the RAF offensive, list well over 200 French localities bombed by the <coughs> RAF, quite aside from those like Toulon, for example, which only received attention from the Americans. <coughs> Things get really interesting, though, when we look at the tonnage of bombs involved. Again, there's some room for uncertainty, but not a whole lot. For the UK, I have estimates of between 71,000 tonnes dropped by the Luftwaffe and 76,500. So let's say a round figure of about 75,000 tonnes dropped on the UK. <coughs> My source for France is the US Strategic Bombing Survey, which gives a figure of 20.6% of the total tonnage dropped by the Allies on Europe. Some versions say 21.8%, but of that order. That comes out at no less than 517,750 metric tons. In other words, nearly seven times the tonnage was dropped on France as was dropped on the UK. Interesting. And of course, this had real consequences for the people who were under attack. Now, it's true, a lot of the Allied bombs that hit France, perhaps a quarter of them, were dropped in relatively remote rural locations in the course of so-called crossbow operations against V weapons. If you're going for V weapons, you're going for places, you're going for sites mostly hidden in the countryside, <coughs> and you're going to damage livestock, you're going to damage land, you're not on the whole going to kill masses of people. But many other bombs, of course, devastate French towns and cities on a scale more comparable with Germany than with the UK. If you think of the images we <coughs> think know of the Blitz, you're always looking at devastated neighbourhoods in cities, which may be badly knocked about, but are very broadly intact. Coventry, <coughs> the famous picture of St Paul's, Victoria Street in London, and where, admittedly these are propaganda pictures, normal life goes on as best it can. But the most extreme French cases go further than that. Le Havre, for example, in the space of a single week, took 9,750 tonnes of bombs. That's about one-eighth of the whole UK total in just one week, in September 44. This is what the start of it looked like. You can see the flares going down on the left, marking the target, and what it looked like about 40 minutes later. This is how the Express, the Daily Express, reported it. <coughs> and 
This was the result. Love in January 45. And this was the result. Or consider the fate of the small Norman town of Ony sur Odon, as recounted by Sir Arthur Harris. On the night of 14th, 15th June, 1,168 tons of bombs were dropped on the road junction of Ony sur Odon, 18 miles south of Bayeux, where army intelligence reported a concentration of enemy motor transport and troops. The road junction, the village, and anything of military importance which it may have contained were entirely obliterated. This was the result from the air, and this from the ground. There weren't any German troops there, any more than there were German troops in the centre of Le Havre when the RAF bombed it on the 5th of September. So we have broadly comparable sort of raw experiences. The French probably suffered fewer deaths, but they certainly took more bombs and suffered greater levels of destruction. Let me now suggest that the raw memories of a normal air raid, I'm not talking about a firestorm, I'm not talking about Hiroshima or Nagasaki, are rather comparable. They include, if you're under it, firstly a terrible sort of fascination. You're looking at extraordinary things, the gleam of silver aircraft in the sun, the fireworks of markers and flares descending gently towards the target. This reaction of the better-off citizens of Chongqing to the bombing of their town in 1940 is not altogether extraordinary. Then you're undergoing novel social experiences, unaccustomed mixing. A Parisian I spoke to in October said that for the teenage boy he had been in 1944, an air age shelter had been a good place to meet girls. You will also see a mixture of solidarity and heroism on the one hand, especially on the part of civil defence volunteers, versus incompetence on the part of the authorities, and meanness, cowardice and criminality on the other hand. I came across one press report in Marseille of a thief who had cut the fingers off an air raid victim in order to get at her rings. You will probably experience an assault on the senses, your sight, your hearing, your smell, and fear, more or less intense, which may recur in response to unexpected triggers later in life. You may well experience downright horror, the wounding and death and mutilation of other human beings, including your own closest family members. And you may experience a sense of sorrow and loss with the death of loved ones and the disappearance of familiar places and neighbourhoods, whether or not you wish to call this trauma. How then are these broadly common experiences remembered in the UK and in France? Let's start with the UK with the help of Angus Calder and Mark Connolly, both of whom have written about the subject. For Connolly, the Blitz continues to play a large role in our national memory. It remains impervious to debunking and is continually reinforced. Along with its 1940 stablemates, he goes on, in other words, Dunkirk and the Battle of Britain, the myth of the Blitz is vital to British national identity. According to this memory, it provided and continues to provide proof of the distinct qualities of the island race. For Angus Calder, author of the myth of the Blitz, the Blitz supports a myth of Brit British or English moral preeminence, buttressed by British unity. Now, you can certainly go into this matter much more deeply. You can talk about left-wing versus right-wing takes on the Blitz and about the failures of the British government that led to Britain having the highest casualty rate per tonne of bombs dropped in Europe. But the views I've just quoted the sceptical Calder, the post-revisionist Connolly, are, I think, fairly instantly recognisable. But what can I offer to sum up the bombing of France? Eddie Florentin wrote books both about the bombing of France and about Le Havre. He concluded the former with a chapter entitled, in English, No Hard Feelings. The latter with the more pointed, What Liberation? <laughs> 
That a single author can veer in this way between generous acceptance and fierce resentment is surely a sign that there isn't really a generally shared memory or a shared interpretation. Similarly, the images I have just presented to you of France, though locally quite well known, do not form part of the national currency of French memory. If you want an iconic picture of French civilians under attack in World War II, you're probably looking at an image of the Exodus of 1940, something like this, Hannah. Um, so for comparable amounts of suffering through bombs, therefore, I'm suggesting that memory is vigorous and structured in the United Kingdom, but weaker and, above all, unstructured in France. No, I say weak and unstructured. I don't say non-existent. On the contrary, when I've conducted research on bombing and mentioned it to French men and women met by chance, I've often been struck by how many of them have a story to tell, often at second or third hand, of relatives lost, of evacuation, of disasters, or of narrow escapes. The memory is there, all right, even 70 years on, but well, vital to <coughs> French national identity? Clearly not, and not by a long way. French memories of bombing lack what Maurice Halbwax called the social frameworks into which personal recollections, often of a painful sort, can be woven. Individual memory, writes Halbwax, is a part or an aspect of group memory, since each impression and each fact, even if it apparently concerns a particular person exclusively, leaves a lasting memory only to the extent that one has thought it over, to the extent that it is connected with the thoughts that come to us from the social milieu. Individual memories, then, and especially of such collective events as bombing raids, are closely tied up with public memories. But public memory, as Nancy Wood writes, testifies to a will or desire on the part of some social group or disposition of power to select and organize representations of the past so that these will be embraced by individuals as their own. It is this public memory of bombing which is at least partially missing in France. On the face of it, this seems surprising. After all, as Pierre Nora notes, France as an identity constructs a future only by deciphering its memory. Memory is decidedly in fashion in France, and historians have been intimately involved in this process. Historiography, Pierre Nora again, begins when history sets itself the task of uncovering that in itself which is not history, of showing itself to be the victim of memory and seeking to free itself from memory's grip. Few places are as preoccupied with memory as France. And yet, as Lindsay Dodd observes, Allied bombing is a black hole in French collective memory. If this is true, what explanations can we offer for the contrast between memories of bombing in the UK and in France? Here are four which I shall now elaborate on. The first is the framing of the narrative in our two <coughs> countries at the time when the bombs were still falling. The second is the cultural production related to bombing after the raids had ended. The third is the role of capital cities, and the fourth is the consistency of the narrative of bombing with a broader national narrative of the war. Framing the narrative first, then, let me return to Connolly and Calder and the notion of a myth of the Blitz. The myth, it must be stressed, and here Calder particularly borrows from uh, Roland Barthes, the myth isn't <coughs> about mere fabrication. Rather, it's about taking an event, giving it a heroic dimension, and airbrushing out some of the less edifying parts. And this started very early. Connolly observes, indeed, if there's something, such a thing as the myth of the Blitz, then it was not a fabrication devised afterwards. Calder is more specific. Faced in the autumn of 1940 
with evidence of widespread panic and looting and depression and antisocial behaviour, the British establishment set about producing the myth. It was developed by, among others, Winston Churchill, Ernest Bevin, J.B. Priestley, the cartoonist David Lowe, the Illustrated Weekly, Picture Post, and, of course, the BBC. To this illustrious list, one might add, for example, the documentary maker Humphrey Jennings, war artists like David Piper and Henry Moore, photographers like Bill Brandt. An awful lot of very able people were on the case very early. Piper was in Coventry the night after the raid that destroyed the cathedral. This was immensely important, not just for domestic purposes, but also for export to the United States. And what the narrative said in the midst of the first full-scale bombing offensive in history, which the British sustained, was Britain can take it. That people would continue to go about their daily lives, whatever the Germans, or as they were more frequently called, the Nazis, dropped on them. More than that, the Blitz made heroes of ordinary British people. It cast them onto the centre stage of history. Or as Calder says, anyone, old, young, rich, poor, male, female, could be a heroic frontline fighter in 1940-1941. So, for example, consider this picture of a bombed-out child and his foster mother on the cover of Picture Post, 28th September 1940, an image of distress at first sight. But if you look under the little boy's arm, it says, two of Hitler's enemies. Calling them victims, the obvious term that springs to mind when you look at this image, is merely pathetic. Calling them enemies of Hitler lends them dignity and places them on the same level as combatants. Moreover, Connolly continues, because so much was asked of ordinary British people, their aspirations and needs could no longer be ignored or dealt with in a piecemeal ma manner. In the midst of the destruction, the British had to be offered reconstruction. They had to be told that their world would not only be replaced, but would be replaced with something better. Hence the link between the destruction of the Blitz and the post-war Britain that Picture Post imagined every year in its first, in its New Year's number from 1941 to 1945, establishing, therefore, a link which remains intact today between the past of the Blitz and the present of the welfare state. In due course, too, of course, the emphasis would be not just on Britain's capacity to take it, but its capacity to give it back in the shape of the developing RAF bombing offensive on Germany. How was the narrative framed in France as the bombs fell? In 1940-1941, British air raids were largely confined to the Channel ports and to Brest and received no particular coverage or even acknowledgement at national level. That changed with the big RAF attack on the Renault works at boulogne billancourt in March 1942, which killed about 380 people. Pétain declared a day of national mourning, and while he wasn't allowed to visit the occupied zone of France, the funerals in the suburbs were grand and public, with Vichy ministers speaking. Henceforth, most major raids would receive extensive coverage in the press, the cinema newsreels and the radio, with big funerals for the major ones. But the message here was very different from that put out in London 18 months earlier. The stress was less on the capacity of the French people to take it as on the wickedness of the Allies and the sufferings of the French. In doing this, the French propagandists scored some palpable hits, such as the poster com connecting the fairly horrendous bombing of Rouen in, uh, on the 18th of April 1944, which killed about 900 civilians in a single night, with the burning of Joan of Arc in the same city by the British in 1431. Murderers always return to the scene of their crime. Nevertheless, and although in the Vichy propaganda we find references <coughs> to the very real efforts of the emergency services, the dominant me message is overwhelmingly gloomy. Consider, for example, the newsreel commentary after the same raid on Rouen by Philippe Henriot, 
Vichy's information minister. You remember, Henriot was supposed to be very good, very eloquent, so much so indeed that the resistance considered it worth mounting a very daring and, as it turned out, successful operation to bump him off on 28th June 1944. But here's Henriot in April, two months before his death, and he talks about the grey dawn of despair. The morning after the raid, he attacks delayed action bombs, dropped, he says, so that no one should remain alive and no house standing. Then he turns positively mawkish. Little houses, modest homes with their lovingly tended little gardens have found what it costs to be classified as a military target by Mr. Churchill. The following month, a French newsreel features the bombing of Lyon, stating, it's only just beginning, you know, adding that the list gets longer day after day, with thousands of dead added to other thousands. Then there's a close-up of a blazing block of flats and a warning that this building, burning like a torch, is not just a building in Lyon, it's the home of a Frenchman. Tomorrow it might be yours. There's not much of France can take it here, nor much of a perspective for a better future. And of course there could be no question of France giving it back to anybody because the only air force to hand was the Luftwaffe. To that I should add, finally, it's not just the message, but the people delivering it. Churchill, Bevin, Priestley, Rowe, the, BB Lowe, the BBC, Picture Post, and so on, are all post-war as well as wartime British institutions. Vichy in general, and Henriot in particular, are very officially discredited after August 1944, best then not remembered. My second explanation is about post-war cultural production. If the terms of how bombing was remembered was set during the war years themselves. They were reinforced by what happened afterwards. Since 1945, the Blitz has inspired a colossal and varied cultural production of books to start with, initially local histories, then national ones. Think of Juliet Gardner's excellent recent study, or Gavin Mortimer's The Longest Night. Lara Feigl's recent book, The Love Charm of Bombs, reminds us of some of the literature of the period. Then there are school books, whether fictionalized or not, to support the inescapable teaching of the Blitz as a topic in our schools. True stories of the Blitz, home in the Blitz, air raids, horrible histories of the Blitz, uh, time train to the Blitz, and so it goes on. Then there are the documentaries, the publication and republication of those photos, and the Imperial War Museum's Blitz experience. Then there is Coventry Cathedral, a most carefully crafted site of memory. Post-war British artists, too, admittedly no one in remotely the same league as Henry Moore or as Piper, have gone on representing the bombing of the UK. Most recently, we have the online, the remarkable online bombsite project, which maps points of impact across London in an interactive website. <coughs> and of course, the memorialization of the Blitz has itself received attention from historians. And France? To the best of my knowledge, there exist two French books on the Allied bombing offensive covering the whole country. One of them, Eddie Florentin's Quand les Alliés bombardaient la France, is a very respectable piece of work. The other appeared with a far-right publishing house, the Édition Nationale. Is the bombing of France dealt with in more general French histories of the dark years? Yes, to some extent. For example, Henri Amoureux's La Grande Histoire des Français sous l'Occupation, or the more recent work by Eric Allary, give it some space. This isn't quite the black hole described by Lindsay Dodd, but if we compare the attention given to the German occupation, or the resistance, or Vichy, or France's role in the Holocaust, in the same histories, the disproportion is quite remarkable. Pause for a moment, too, to consider one of the founding texts of France's memory of World War II, de Gaulle's War Memoirs. It contains about 10 pages in the three volumes. Incidentally, it is remarkable that on no occasion did de Gaulle say he considered 
the bombing offensive of sufficient importance to take it up directly with the Allies. He left that to the CFLN's foreign affairs spokesman, René Massilly. Surely an extreme indication of the old adage that de Gaulle was more concerned with the grandeur of France than with the well-being of the French. I would add that British and American publications also tend on balance to marginalize the Allied bombing of France. This is perhaps less true of the military histories where the transportation plan, that is, the attack on French rail centers which occupied the Allied air forces for much of spring 1944, is invariably covered, not least because it offers a good example of argument about strategy at the highest level. It's also true that William Hitchcock's recent work entitled Liberation, subtitled The Bitter Road to Freedom and covering the whole of Western Europe, begins with the bombing of France. And two, liberation, two works on the liberation of Paris open with the La Chapelle raid on the night of 20th of April. Nevertheless, it's still possible to read accounts of the occupation that don't cover bombing at all. It's still possible to read a book on Franco-British relations in the two world wars that leaves the reader totally unaware of the fact, fairly enormous I would have thought in the context, that the British, the British killed between 30,000 and 40,000 French civilians, many of them, though not all, quite uselessly, in attacks which today, today, might be considered as war crimes. But to return to French books, the paradox is that what is all but absent from the literature at national level is abundant locally and regionally. Since roughly the 1980s, but sometimes earlier, local and regional historians, from the meticulous professionals of the Centre de Recherche d'Histoire Quantitative at Caen, to innumerable amateurs, some of them highly skilled, some frankly a bit nerdy, have produced accounts of the bombing of many French cities. They've also collected large numbers of witness testimonies, going against what Robert Gilday describes as the tendency of French historians to dismiss oral history as partial and partisan. It just doesn't get through, or not sufficiently, to the national level. And this lends a certain parochialism to French memories of bombing, where many believe that theirs is the only locality to have been seriously bombed. At the movies, meanwhile, the only things that Allied aircraft seem to drop on France are supplies or fighters for the resistance. With possibly one exception, the only film, to the best of my knowledge, to deal with Allied bombers over France is La Grande Vadrouille, <laughs> a comedy dating from 1966 starring Bourville, Louis de Funès, <coughs> and our own Terry Thomas, a great favourite shown regularly on French television at Christmas time, but not one, it has to be said, that engages precisely with the issue of bombing. As for documentaries, the first documentary covering the nationwide bombing of France will go out in 2014, en France 3, in May. There are other forms of memorialization. Plaques to civilian victims have been added to war memorials in towns such as Le Havre. As for the big material sites of memory, there's no bombing equivalent to Oradour sur Glane, or to Mont Valérien, or even to the monument at the Drancy internment camp. The Mémorial de Caen integrates that city's destruction into the wider conflict and hosts conferences and has gathered witness accounts from across Normandy. But more broadly, it remains the case that cultural production relating to bombing remains on a far smaller scale than that relating to the Blitz, and it is much more provincial. And this brings me to thy third point, the role of capital cities. And I think it's a fairly easy one to grasp. On the British side, as Connolly remarks, what becomes obvious from the visual record and the way it's been used since the war is that London is the city of the Blitz. St. Paul's Cathedral, shrouded in smoke, dominates the memory just as it once dominated the London skyline. Or again, London 
set the standard for the rest of the country during the war. The way the London Blitz was reported and interpreted ensured that other British cities had to react with equal fortitude, resolution and courage. The highly controlled presentation of London meant a, a behavioural norm had been established by the autumn of 1940 that demanded emulation by others. One might add that just under half of all British victims of bombing were Londoners. If the capital city has no right to a monopoly of memories of World War II bombing in the UK, it has the right to a very large slice. Now, imagine for a moment <coughs> how different France's memory might have been if the Allies, instead of undertaking raids on the industrial and transport targets of the Paris suburbs with part of the load sometimes spilling over into the capital itself, for example in Montmartre, had been stupid enough to start a full-scale offensive against Paris. Of course, they didn't, and we should all be very thankful <coughs> for it. Parisians were able to watch and applaud as the bombers went for Biancourt in 1942, though the bombers came uncomfortably close in later raids. But what if 30,000 Parisians had died? Even more than London, Paris is a cultural capital, it's hard to imagine their deaths going down as a relatively minor event of the occupation or escaping the national memory. My final point concerns the consistency of the narrative of bombing with a broader national narrative of the war, and this is absolutely crucial. Relatively speaking, and despite the left-wing and right-wing takes on the war, the British narrative of World War II is relatively unified, and the Blitz sits in the middle of it, even becoming, as Lucy Noakes observes, the central event in the public memory of the war. It's easy to see why. The chronology helps for a start. September 1940 to May 1941 was the period when the British Empire stood alone against Nazi Germany. And then... The Blitz is an easily understood, dramatic story that does not require much expert knowledge of military, diplomatic, or political history. As Connolly observes, the Blitz feels like a film. It has a great script. A small gang of fiercely independent people refuse to cave in to the bad guys, and you can write the rest of the script yourselves. All of this, of course, has a bit of a downside, too. As Calder observes, the British have never seen their own Blitz as one example of a widespread 20th century phenomenon. Perhaps they should. Contrast, though, this picture of coherence with the place of bombing in the French narrative of World War II. Well, for a start, is there a French narrative, a French narrative of World War II? At the very least, it's a narrative that's been repeatedly transformed. For example, by the appearance of Paxton's work in 1972, by the Touvier and Papon trials, by President Chirac's recognition of France's share in responsibility for the Holocaust, and so on. As Olivier Viviorca eloquently writes, in a study commissioned, interestingly enough, by the Direction de la Mémoire et du Patrimoine du Ministère de la Défense, France still suffers and will continue to suffer from a divided memory of the war years because what happened to different groups of French people was so different, but also because different groups organized and lobbied for special recognition, often with financial benefits attached and often at the expense of others. Within this still unstable hierarchy of groups, as Dodd observes, French civilians who didn't participate in resistance activities have been described, ascribed a low moral authority. They waited, they stood by, some even profited. Now, fragmented the French narrative may be, but it isn't impossibly scattered. As Dodd notes, the powerful filters of resistance and collaboration through which all history of the dark years must pass were activated from 1944. And whatever the variation between them, this duality has been a constant that is very difficult to get away from. And of course, the Allied bombing of France doesn't fit into it at all. Who are the good guys in this story? Are they the ones who promise to liberate you, but who for the moment are dropping bombs on you? Or are they the ones who are trying in an often difficult context to organize some form of civil defense, but who spend a lot of the rest of their time sending Jews to their deaths or organizing the arrest and torture of resistance suspects. You can understand, in a way, 
in the, why, in the already tortured and tortuous realm of French World War II memories, this might seem a complication too far. And so, as Dodd notes, bombing is vivid in personal and local memories, but dominant national narratives of resistance and collaboration have squeezed it from public discourse. So, too, contrast the eloquent si simplicity of the Blitz movie script with the inherent complexity of the Allied bombing of France. Any survivor of an air raid wants to know why, especially if they've lost everything. The short answer, the Allies didn't mean you any harm. They bombed your town in order to liberate you, supposes a tangible link between bombing and liberation, which in practice is exceedingly rare. Truer answers, such as the British thought they were losing the Battle of the Atlantic and were willing to try anything, which helps to explain the destruction of Lorient, or the heavy bomber force was the best weapon to hand to block the progress of German reinforcements, but it couldn't be very accurate to explain a lot of the destruction of Normandy, or the Allies thought there were Germans there to explain Oni sur Odon, are inherently unsatisfying, certainly more so more, certainly more unsatisfying, less satisfying than the Blitz narrative, Hitler bombed you because he was a bad man, bent on world domination, but we got him in the end. And people who prefer simple explanations may feel inclined to dust off the old Vichy claim that the Anglo-Saxons bombed us to eliminate French competition. Or worse, uh, these are um, a couple of lines I've found from websites uh, on the far left, the work workers were the main victims, sorry, not quite correctly written, not due to aiming errors, but to crush the workers who might have rebelled at any moment. And on the right, if you add things up properly, the 39-45 war caused more deaths just among the French than among the Jews of all countries. Um, okay, a further dimension to the question of finding a narrative is the problem of French agency. I was struck and when doing my own work about bombing, to notice how many quite sensible circulars on civil defence went out over some of the most infamous signatures in modern French history. Pierre Laval, René Bousquet, even once or twice Joseph Darnon. Perhaps this isn't, this isn't surprising. You could probably say the same about Goebbels, and it hardly alters the iniquity of the men concerned. But what of the mayors and prefects who also try to organize the protection of civilians at local level, but who will have to collabor collaborate with the Germans in order to do so? Should they have stayed at their posts, to which many had been appointed by Vichy rather than elected, and done what they could, or was the price collaboration too high? How do you rate the usefulness of institutions like the Secours National, which helped bombed out families, but got some of its money, at least till 1942, from confiscated Jewish property. Or, far worse, the Comité Ouvrier de Secours Immédiat, which owed almost all its income to the same source. At what level does working within the apparatus of the Vichy state to save lives from bombing become acceptable? These moral mazes remain largely unexplored. So we have a highly contrasted memorialization of bombing in the UK and France, which on both sides in some ways is inherently unsatisfactory. On the one hand, the justified and largely successful celebration and memorialization of the United Kingdom's resistance during the Blitz has come at the price of a certain triumphalism and a certain insularity. We suffered, but we won rather than civilians suffered across Europe, many of them, as it happens, at our hands. In France, on the other hand, the dominant narratives, all of them built around the two poles of resistance and collaboration and the reality of bombing, remain disconnected. Certainly, the real public joy in most localities at the liberation overtook and displaced resentment and grief at the bombing but rather less so, perhaps, in the long term, particularly in those places where a whole generation lived for a decade or more in Nissan huts or wooden cabins in the ruins of their cities. In La Havre, the sense that things were better before is shared even by people whose parents weren't born in 1944. This sense of an unrecognized wrong is dangerous. It generates 
not necessarily open resentment, but a sense of victimhood that can pass down the generations. And so Lindsay Dodd argues childhood memories of war and bombing, and with them traumas, have gone unheard, many of them passing to the grave unresolved. Now there are signs that this may be changing in France. In a speech given at the Cimetière de la Chauvinière in Nantes on 16th September 2013, Prime Minister Jean-Marc Ayrault commemorated one of the bloodiest Allied raids on the city of which he had been mayor, on the city of Nantes 70 years earlier. And he didn't pull many punches. The attack, he said, lasted a quarter of an hour, but it blasted and devastated whole neighbourhoods. It was done by nearly 150 American flying fortresses. It left charred bodies in the midst of the ruins. Half a million tons of Allied bombs, continued the Prime Minister, smashed down on French territory. Certainly it was necessary to hit the Nazi war machine straight and hard, but the civilian population were often the first victims. If this had been all he had said, it would merely have reinforced the sense of victimhood that I referred to earlier. But he went on to do two things. First, he praised the emergency services, whose members risked and in many cases lost their lives to save those of others. In a landscape of wartime memory, where the ordinary French are often presented as standing on the sidelines, focusing on their own survival as they waited to be liberated, it is surely salutary to rem be reminded of these sacrifices. Secondly, he placed the bombing in the wider context of a war that claimed as many as 55 million victims and of the reconstruction of ravaged countries by the wartime generation. Ayrault got the balance about right, but it was only one speech and it received minimal media coverage compared with, for example, Chirac's speech of July 1995. It needs to be done again and ideally this summer. But of course, the responsibility for reshaping this slice of public memory doesn't only lie with French politicians. It lies with historians, it lies with the media, it lies with those who devise the history curriculum in schools and not only in France. Anyone in this country and in the United States who should wonder why the French are not more grateful for their liberation in 1944 might do well to put it down, not to de Gaulle's personal prickliness or to the communists, but to the price in blood paid by French civilians as well as by Allied soldiers and airmen. Thank you very much. Well, thank you very much indeed, uh, Andrew, for that uh, splendid uh, lecture, which uh, drew a tremendous uh, contrast between uh, her forgotten blitz on the one hand and uh, a very well uh, remembered uh, blitz on the uh, on the other. Uh, I think uh, we've got a, a few moments for uh, for questions, and uh, Andrew is uh, willing to uh, try to uh, to answer them. So, uh, if uh, you'd like to sit in there, uh, do you want to chat? To uh, I'm okay. I'm okay. Uh, fine. To uh, perch on that one, no, Andrew. Um, okay. Yeah, well deserved. Uh, well deserved rest. Thank you. Thanks. Right. Um, thanks very much for that. The, I have heard anecdotally one time that somebody suggested that there was a memory in France of a differentiation between the British bombers and the American bombers, and that this person told me that he remembered that the British bombers flew lower, took greater risks, and were therefore more accurate, and that this was something that he remembered. And I'm just, you didn't mention, I just wonder, is there a, have you come across yes. the differentiation yes. of memory yes. between American and British? Yes, yes. Um, I, I think it's, um, I think I can explain it, and it's, and it's a, 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 in some ways a well-founded memory. Um, it is explicable because the Americans um, always believed that over Germany they were doing precision bombing. They had an, a bomb site called the Norden bomb site, which they never let the British have, and which they considered was um, accurate enough to put a bomb into a pickle barrel from a height of 25,000 feet. It, it, apparently it worked quite well in very bright skies over Kansas. <laughs> um, less well in the fog of Europe. And um, 
So, uh, by the admission of people like Walt Rostow, who knew about these things, a lot of American bombing over Germany was actually not as precise as the Americans thought. Nevertheless, this myth that the Americans do precision bombing, unlike the British, um, persisted so that when they went over France, they didn't see any reason to do anything else. <coughs> they bombed from heights of about 7,000 meters, and typically um, seven aircraft bombed, as it were, in a box. The first aircraft opened its, opened its bomb bay, and all the others did at the same time. Now, the British, <coughs> certainly after 1942, uh, they didn't pretend to do precision bombing over Germany. Um, they were doing area bombing. They were trying to obliterate whole cities. And there's only one case in Lorient where, the, um, where an explicit, or in, in the Biscay ports, where there is an explicit order that goes out to bomber command to do area bombing on French towns. Um, otherwise, the British realized you know, they couldn't treat France the same way as they treated Germany, and therefore they had to devise other techniques, which indeed involved uh, going in rather low. And there are a certain number of British raids that are absolutely exemplary. At the same time, however, there are also an awful lot which weren't, um, either because they were just so damn heavy. I mean, the, the raids I... Um, referred to uh, over the arc, and if you drop 9,750 tons of bombs, um, uh, you're, going to, you're going to knock out a lot of civilian buildings. But also, because with the technology available at the time, so much can go wrong. I mean, all, all of the, all of the, the, the British are developing, sorry, let me go back a tiny bit. Um, in, 19, in December 1940, the British bombed Marseille in a small way. And along with the bombs, they let go um, an, a lot of leaflets entitled La Maledizione di Garibaldi. And they're all in Italian. <laughs> um, <laughs> The British, the, the, the small force involved, I think, clearly thought they were bombing Genoa. And, um, the, and, the, and the, the then free zone was off limits to the RAF until November 42. And the British government actually put its hand up and said this was a mistake. And um, by the beginning of 43, they'd paid over some compensation to France. Um, and of course, by the beginning of 43, uh, they could start bombing at the south of France again because it was no longer the free zone. But, um, but that gives you an idea of the accuracy of, of the RAF early in the war. Um, and so they're constantly developing you know, better navigational tools by you know, 1941, 1942, 1943. That wouldn't have been possible. But still, these tools you know, can go wrong. There's any number of ways that you can get it wrong. And then if you put your markers down in the wrong place, then you're no better than the Americans would possibly were. So that the case of Rouen, for example, where they're going for the marshalling yards but actually hit quite a lot of the main city of Rouen, or a place called Bruce uh, near Rennes where um, there's a, a depot nearby, a military depot nearby that the RAF are going for, but they miss it by a mile or so and, um, and obliterate a French village. Um, and these, these are quite common. I have not done, perhaps I should try sometime, I have not attempted a calculation of you know, did the Brits kill more people than the Americans. I would say they prob probably did. There are also other variables that intervene. For example, the, if you take two sort of classic raids by the Americans, which killed a lot of people. They're both daytime raids, of course. The, the Americans bomb in the daytime, the British bomb at night. The Americans, therefore, are more likely to bomb when people in the streets. And in both Nantes and Marseille, where, both, where over a thousand people get killed, <coughs> they're both places that have received a lot of um, alerts. And it's a very fine day, and people are out on the streets. And the sirens sound, you know, again. And 
but so far they haven't, you know, the, the planes have overflown their cities. And so they look up and they point at these fortresses, silver inside, oh. and then suddenly the bombs start falling. And the great majority of victims in both cases hadn't take, taken shelter, they were killed in the street. And you find very quickly that you know, the first raid, even, even, in, even where there are sort of eight or nine raids, the first raid often kills half the total number of victims for that city. So you know, another reason why the Americans um, killed a lot of people in certain raids is simply those conditions, they're bombing the daylight. But yes, the reputation, absolutely there. Um, sorry, come back to you. Sorry, just, just a very quick question. I was very taken by the table at the very beginning of, of your lecture where you compared the bombings mm. uh, in different uh, 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 countries. But the, the tonnage or the, or the No, 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 that was, it was the number of, of civilian deaths. Yeah. Now, <coughs> one thing I did notice was <coughs> you hadn't adjusted for relative population size. So the question becomes, uh, does it make a difference, the fact that, that a smaller percentage of the population was killed in France compared with, with Britain in terms of the development of a national cultural consciousness relating to bombing? No, not, not, not the tons before. Sorry. Um, I mean, you, you made the point that basically the same number of people die in both places, mm -hmm. but relatively that's not the case, presumably. Presumably the population of France is much higher than the UK. No, no. no. no, 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 no. Is it the same? So, uh, uh, the population of the UK is a bit higher by this stage, but I mean, it's, we're, we're about, about 40 million in France, although possibly rather fewer because an awful lot of them are in Germany at the time. Um, and um, population of, what, 45 million for the UK, I think? So, so like it's the same. Yeah. It, it's, 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 it's yeah. Sorry, you have a, a question? Going back to the precision bombing, RAF, etc., yeah. the fact that they were flying at night, mm -hmm. uh, one of the tools, if I put it in that terms, that they developed, of course, were the pathfinders. Yes. And that really <coughs> meant precision bombing at, at a very high level. What's my interpretation? Um, I'd like to know your comment. <laughs> <laughs> hmm. And, and amongst uh, eighteen percent of bombs within a five hundred yard radius. Okay. Has any work done been done looking at the RAF crews? Because a lot of them who did precision bombing, nighttime flying, were French, French resistance, mm -hmm. Polish, and East and Eastern Europeans who volunteered for very dangerous missions. Yes. Um, I mean, about a quarter of all RAF crews were either Commonwealth. I mean, I think I think the big, the biggest contingent was Canadian. Mm -hmm. It's either Canadian or Australian. Uh, I mean, it's Canada, Australia, then quite a long way behind South Africa, <coughs> Rhodesia, New Zealand. Um, French, I'm afraid, come quite a long way behind the Poles. Um, sure. About the French volunteer, I mean, the classic French uh, precision mission is on um, the power station at Chevilly la Rue, uh, in which Pierre Mendes France um, takes part. Um, or Amiens, of course. The, the prison raid? Yes. Yeah, yeah. Um, that is about, I mean, about as much as I can as I can say on the subject. That I mean, the the, the sort of creme de la creme uh, of, of of bomber commanders, six one seven squadron, who are the, the dam busters, mm -hmm. um, and they do, for example, um, a raid on uh, the Normi Horn factory at Limoges, which is you know, absolutely exemplary. I mean, it's it's uh, they. they, they, they Leonard Cheshire flies over factory several times to make sure that the workers get out in time, and then he drops his marker from a height of about 100 feet, and then uh, and then the others weigh in with equal precision. But that is you know, that is extraordinarily impressive. It, uh, the, but things like the raids on the Havre or the raid on La Chapelle, or most of the raids on the um, rail marshalling yards, 
just can't get to that level of precision. And particularly the railroads, of course, um, typically a marshalling yard in France at the time has a seated de cheminot mm. on either side of it, and some of the bombs go wide. You know, it's, um okay, the final uh, question, then I think we'll... Uh, that's not so, much, have, a, not so much a question, a comment. My father worked in operational research for Bomber Command and flew uh, as a civilian because they had to be not subject to military discipline so that they could um, criticize the... Uh, uh, the so you worked with Solly Zuckerman? Yeah. yeah. And um, he flew um, with uh, some of the bombing crews to observe or rather with the reconnaissance crews to reserve, to observe afterwards how precise the, the bombing had been. He talked about it very little. So although I kind of knew this as a, as a bit of my family kind of mythology, but what he did say led me to suppose that he thought they did their best, but their best was really not very good at all. Okay. And he, 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 he knew they were trying to you know, hit the marshalling yards but um, in his observations and his kind of, the kind of memories that he had out of that, of that period um, suggested that um, he, didn't, he didn't think that all their, their work had been very successful in um, uh, avoiding, in hitting the targets they really wanted to hit. Yeah, I mean, the... the, the, the you know, the fundamental problem is, uh, you know, Harris said um, the heavy bomber is a first-class strategic re weapon, mm. it is um, a fifth-rate <laughs> tactical weapon, that basically they're using a tool which was, uh, whatever you think of area bombing, RAF Bomber Command was quite good at doing that, yep. um, for a job that it really hadn't been intended to, and that Harris indeed didn't, didn't like doing very much, not especially for moral reasons, but because he didn't think it was the best way to, um, to, to set about defeating the Germans. Um, sorry, two other points related to that. One, um, about pathfinders. An interesting point about pathfinders <coughs> is that they also give the people under the bombs a bit of time mm -hmm. to, uh, to take shelter, because if you see those markers coming down, you know, you know that it's for you in a way that people um, standing in the street don't necessarily know when you've got when you have an aircraft flying over you. Um, secondly, uh, Harris to to uh, put in a good word for Harris. Harris um, in October 1944 launched a fund within Bomber Command, and he invited crews to contribute up to a shilling each. Um, to, for the relief of French children, either whose parents had been uh, shot for helping Allied airmen, or more generally who had been orphaned by the war, and it by the by Allied bombing, sorry, and it uh, collected, I think, uh, about twelve thousand quid, which mm -hmm. uh, translated into about two and a half million francs, which was transferred to uh, the health ministry mm -hmm. and gratefully received. Well, I think uh, that uh, notion of uh, entente uh, cordiale <laughs> is, uh, is probably uh, a good one on, uh, on which to uh, conclude. I uh, omitted to, as I mentioned at the beginning, that this uh, lecture has been sponsored by the uh, Association for the Study of Modern and Contemporary France, as well as the uh, Society for the, uh, for the Study of uh, French History. And I mention that now because, uh, in fact, uh, you might have noticed a, a machine playing away there recording the, uh, the lecture, which uh, if you want to, uh, to hear it again or recommend it to, uh, to your friends, uh, will be uh, available on the uh, Society for the Study of French History uh, website as a podcast uh, in, uh, in due, uh, due course. And uh, I, I shall certainly be uh, listening in when it's, uh, when it's, uh, when it's available. Uh, and uh, I'm sure you'd like to, uh, to join me in, uh, in, in once again uh, thanking uh, Andrew. For